Hello? Can you hear? Okay. Can you can you hear me? I'm running the show, just to be clear. So, Paul, no trying to, no, just kidding. You're, you're good at giving deference. So, um, I'm Andrea with the Bangs. Nice to see you all. Oh, I feel like we've moved in. That's good. Um, can you hear me? Is it, Cass, is it, okay. We're, we're good? Okay. So, my talk, I need my hands. I'm a hand talker. So, my my, it's not a talk, it's, it'll be a conver conversation, conversation um, between Paul and me. But I, I want to start by, um, oh yeah, maybe some of you haven't seen my channel. My uh, YouTube channel is called Andrea with the Bangs, and my podcast is called uh, She Wonders Why, because I'm a very curious person, and it also was vague enough that I could talk about whatever I want. <laughs> so... Lately, though, I've been wanting to explore um, femininity and masculinity as found in stories. Uh, I see story and narrative both in the ancient forms and modern forms in, like, say, film or television as our way that we can focus on understanding uh, the feminine and the masculine. And um, so... Our conversation today will be centered on um, femininity and masculinity and how to understand that in a world where these roles are becoming blurred. And so, Paul, you said something about um, the wind and how we, can, we can't see it, but we can see it move the leaves. Um, I felt like that about understanding what it is to participate in the feminine or in the divine feminine. And, and I, don't, I, I wouldn't have known, hey, there's a meaning crisis and uh, roles as well are not clear. I wouldn't have known that a few, four or five years ago. I wouldn't have known to say that exactly. But I could feel it. And I, we all have our own personal stories. I personally grew up without a father. My father passed away when I was just a year old. So I thought it was that. Like, oh, I, I, I'm missing something foundational, so it must be that I don't know how to handle or be this, um, embody this, um, like, womanhood or, or femininity in a way that I understand. It must have been because of my own personal story. But I think it's bigger. <laughs> and so, um, Paul, I guess I want to know, why, why would you say um, understanding who you are within the feminine or who you are within the masculine, why is that foundational? Why is it so important? Towards the end of the war, Thomas came to sort of redirect a bit, I think, because what one of the things that many people noticed who have had a fair amount of experience with estuary, which is a very different group process tool than the Mandela process that we just saw, was all of these guys rushing into the middle, making their points. This was very masculine. And, and we could feel that masculine energy. And there's nothing wrong with masculine energy. The when Jordan Peterson had his first on-stage conversation with Sam Harris, that was the first time I began to, in some senses, note the tension, the masculine and feminine tension in the meaning crisis. Because I, I immediately differentiated God number one and God number two, which got a lot of interest because as a monotheist, then everybody wanted to know either what was God number three or if I was dividing God and just, just, just initiated all of those dogmatic reactions. But as I, I said to everyone that one and two are they're just sort of containers on my workbench. And as I began to continue to understand Verveke's work, as I began to understand the, relation, the agent arena relationship, as I listened to Jonathan Peugeot and you discuss, we did a three-way conversation about the feminine. The feminine has a very peculiar dynamic 
that is extraordinarily powerful yet elusive. The feminine, at the same time, draws attention and yet hides. There were, a while back, there was a viral video about a very attractive young woman in a gym wearing very tight clothing, doing a particular exercise that looked a lot like a sexual act, complaining about the 95 other, 95% of other people in the gym who were men watching her do this exercise. Now, for most men, we're like, if that happens in front of me, I can almost not pay attention to it. And you might ask the woman, why would you wear that and do that exercise in plain view of all of the men if you didn't want attention? And the truth is, she did want a kind of attention, and she did not want other attention. And so that's part of the dynamic of the feminine, because the moment you make the implicit attention explicit, there's something of the feminine power has been violated, and it goes back to the other position. And so when we, with, now an estuary model is very much a small group protocol, which means in my, once I ideally try to run it in a group of five or six people, which is a closed circle, whereas in the fishbowl, it's a much different dynamic. It's made for a very different type of processing group, a much larger group. So here's the interesting thing about the feminine, which, is, which would be, in many ways, the listening mode. Once the listening mode draws attention to itself or is pointed out, it is in that way it becomes masculinized. And so part of what we're dealing with as a culture that has gotten, in Ian McGilchrist terms, you know, far too, he's, he's got the, the master and the emissary, has gotten far too oriented in some ways to the masculine well, when the feminine tries to, when there's a realize that there's an imbalance between the two, you can't really, to the degree that you impose the feminine, you turn it into masculinity. And in that sense, it's a very tricky dance to rebalance the two. Agent arena works similarly. And so in the meaning crisis, one of the things that I think has been helpful with respect to estuary, which John Van Donk noted fairly early on, was the real power of the estuary protocol is listening, not talking. The listening is feminine. And when I was looking at this process, I said to somebody this morning, you know the real power of this process? It's the relinquishing of the chair. We don't notice that. We pay attention to the taking of the chair, but if no one relinquishes, the process dies. And so I think it's in that sense that it, the feminine is so hard for us to pay attention to because in a sense, the drawing of attention to it you lose it, and so you have to sort of let it be, but that's really hard. So why has it become so muddled? Like why is the feminine being so easily turned masculine? It has it all, it's not always been this way throughout time immemorial. I feel like our ancestors had a clearer concept of this is feminine, we don't mess with that this is masculine, we don't mess with that. Not to romanticize the past. But it feels like we don't know where lines are. Yeah. Is 
in in modernity, the emissary is the um, the explicit, the vis, the 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 thing that you can see. Um, it is the conscious. It is the controlled, and by virtue of that, it is always limited and agentic. I'm 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 not a golden age thinker that thinks in the past. It was better in the past, and we've somehow lost it. Modernity has brought to this dynamic a certain problem because in many ways, modernity is very masculine and agentic and explicit. And so you, you see this in conversations around masculine and feminine. You'd hear this in the church that women have no power in the church unless they are in the positions of ecclesiastical office or visual structural authority. I've lived in churches all my life, and I know that's not true. Because often, some of the most powerful people in the church are the women, even if they hold no positions. I had a friend who was a minister, and he was having a council meeting, and in that church, only men could be on council. And one of his elders, they had a proposal, and one of his elders said, I have to pray about this. And the minister handed him his cell phone and said, why don't you call your wife right now? Because he knew, and, and this is the dynamic between the arenic, which tends to be feminine, and the agentic, which tends to be masculine, that, I mean, container came up in the conversation this morning. Container is often quite, it's the implicit context that maybe we can't name, but in a modern sphere, if you can't name it in modernity, that doesn't exist. Ah, the feminine, we're always in that context, and we just are not conscious of the context. And so I think for that reason, people have noted, for example, in Hollywood stories, which is, you know, what you've really been focusing on, Women have status when they act like men. And it's gotten to the point of female characters always winning physical fights, which we look at and say, nah, I'm, I'm six foot four, 240 pounds. My wife is five foot six, 130 pounds. Or should I say that? Um, my wife's pretty tough. Should we edit, edit it out? <laughs> <laughs> she, she never watches this stuff. But in a fist fight, but who has power? Oh, my wife is always an arena that I am working in, even here thousands of miles away. So I think the struggle came in modernity, and now that modernity is receding, people don't know how to act. What do you mean by modernity is receding? Similar to what I said this morning, I, what somebody made, Dr. Jim, the cardiologist from Idaho, he was the one that pointed out to me, he said, new atheism arose because the modernists began to feel it slipping away. When someone is secure in their position, they can be very feminine. They don't need to talk. They don't need to assert and demand. But when you feel what you value slipping away, that's when they arise. And he said, you know, the implicit modernism is receding, and so the new atheists arose to try to bring it back to the top. But what that showed, and I think you pointed out very well, there's this, there's this enormous... Irony with Sam Harris that on one hand he is the most modern masculine asserter, but then he says, Oh, but we need meditation. Oh, well, explain that. He doesn't explain it very well because it doesn't fit into his system. But modernity has been, we probably as a culture reached peak modernity in the 20th century. It began to recede probably in the First World War. 
But these things take a long time and they're very uneven. So I think part of the reason we are seeing what we've been seeing in this little corner is modernity is receding and we're beginning to understand, again, in Ian McGilchrist's terms, that the emissary is only an emissary and we've not been paying any attention to the power of the master. So if we've been, okay, to use the Ian McGilchrist example, if we've been paying mostly attention to and acting out of the emissary, it seems like on the one side, women are being told, you can be a mom, you can have a career, you can be whatever you want, you can have it all, we're being told we can do this. Men are being told, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. So from what you're saying, it sounds almost like, why, why aren't we super well practiced at the masculine? And then why, are the, why, why isn't it like the women being told, oh, we don't know what to do with you? It seems like it should be flipped, but it's not. Are you following me? Yeah. So, is there a question women, in there? Women. <laughs> um, why is it that way then? Why isn't it split? Women have been saying, we don't have any power. And men, and they've gotten men to a degree to say, okay. Dynamic like that. You understand who has the power. I, 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 for, I forget who it was having the conversation, but someone said, Women always control the cultural narrative. And you could say, well, how can you say that? Because the men are the ones in all of the explicit positions. Yeah. But you really control the marionette. The person on the stage or the person holding the strings. And it's an extremely capable power move to say, I'm not holding any strings. Okay, so when, no, no, I'm not disagreeing, no, I agree. No, what, the thing that I find, when I, when I realized, the, when I was given the words, you know, th these are all things I've seen, but I didn't know the, the words to explain. When I was given the explanation of, well, well, we all want to be the hero. We want to be the Luke Skywalkers instead of the Princess Leias. I actually think Princess Leia had a lot of agency, by the way, just to be clear. Um, and they were the same age, right? And she was always way more, whatever. Sorry, I just recently watched Star Wars with my boys and it was nice. Anyway, so it, but when I was given the, the, understood this role of, I want to be the superhero, women wanting to, have that active role in the hero's journey rather than the more passive role of being the damsel in distress. Um, when, when I understood, oh, this is what's being asked. Like, oh, we want to be the ones who save rather than being saved. We don't want to be saved. You know, we want to be the one doing the saving. That's, that's what my interpretation of this is what who says that having physical strength and vanquishing the dragon physically who says that's better what what if you used other things to i don't know like feminine wiles are a thing <laughs> you know like scarlett johansson she was like oh the early marvel um movies i like i really i wish they would have had me fight my way in instead of using her, like, uh, Black Widow's looks to get in. Like, you left the men standing instead of killing them, or, you know, or, or knocking them out or whatever it is that happens to them in these Marvel films. But, like, you used your implicit way of getting in without being super explicit about getting in, you know, getting into the building or whatever. So I, I don't, when did, who says, who says that being... A physically strong is better than the way, say, um, Sarah Connor is strong in Terminator 2. I, I always use this example. I say, who is stronger, men or women? Two men can best the strongest man. 
I mean, let's talk about real fights, okay? Not what we see on Hollywood, one takes on a dozen. Generally speaking, two men can best the strongest man. One woman can colonize a world. What did Helen of Troy do? And let's look at the Star Wars story. So how does it start? No, 2D2. Oh, there's something on there. Fiddles with it. Little thing. Help me, Obi-Wan. You're my only hope. Okay, now let's... What we're going to do is watch Luke. But where is the center of the story? Let's not watch us watching Luke. Let's look where Luke is watching. What is the center of the story? What is moving that story forward? It is the princess. Luke is being drawn to that princess. Now, all of our attention is being paid to Luke, moving and acting and fighting and failing. And there's the hero's journey, but the hero's journey is always being gravitationally drawn towards the princess. The princess is the center of the story, not Luke. But it's sort of a deception because all of our attention is we're watching Luke. And so culturally, we've been watching Luke and saying, ah, Luke is the center of the story. But that's not where Luke is looking. Luke is looking at the princess. He's going to kiss his sister now. We all know that's coming. But um, the princess she, she, is... She kisses him. Oh, okay. Well, the princess is the center of the story, but that's the best example of the feminine. You don't see it because you're watching Luke but she's actually the center of the gravity and all of the story is moving in her direction. And then all the scenes after, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get the princess. Now, modernity looks at Luke and his power and says, that's power. Okay, let me ask you, what's more powerful? The artillery shell or the gravity that's going to bring it to land and explode. We all pay attention to the artillery shell or the rocket, but you know what's powering it? The gravity. The gravity is the feminine. And so in this case, it's Princess Leia who's, help me, Obi-Wan, that's what's moving the story forward. But we don't see it, which is why it works. So why why don't we see her importance? Like, why do women, look, it feels like, okay, it feels to me like we've been told, we've been sold a narrative that you want to be Luke. You want to be the hero, men and women. But women, it's new, new. So you, you should also want to be the hero too. You should not want to be saved. That's weak. It's looked at as weak to be needing to be saved. and But from where did that come, Obi-Wan Kenobi? <laughs> the Garden of Eden. That's the ba but that's the basic narrative. Now, again, you're talking to a Calvinist. And what that means is, as human beings, we cannot secure ourselves, we cannot save ourselves. We can't. One virus can wipe us out. One, one cell that decides it doesn't want to play with the rest of the cells and becomes cancer puts the entire organism. We can't save ourselves. And, well, we want to be self-sufficient. Oh, do you mean we want to be God? Yeah, we do want to be God. Can we? No. And so... The, the, the interesting dynamic between the masculine and the feminine is the feminine actually has the power and has always had the power, but here's an interesting reality about feminine power. It isn't so much, it isn't wielded like masculine power. It isn't as agentic as masculine power. It is more received. So, like I said, one man, the strongest man can be bested by two or maybe three men. But 
the most beautiful woman can best a nation. Okay. But that power that she wields, like, so the hot girl that goes to the gym, she would like to be able to wield that power and only direct it to the one guy she wants and in that way colonize him. That power doesn't work that way. That power just goes out and she starts colonizing a dozen men. And she's like, no, 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 no. Sorry, you have received that power and in a sense, even in your passivity, that's how you wield it. And women sort of know this. You can't make it happen. You let it happen. And that's their frustration. They wait for the suitor to propose. Do they? Do they, they Paul? Well, they, they, they lose status sometimes when they don't because, in a sense, they relinquish the feminine and take on the masculine but men have feminine and masculine. Women have masculine and feminine. We all have both. All Both is within all of us. But the different modes have different powers. And so much of what's been happening is women have been really working hard to wield the masculine. That's fine. They do it well. But these things are two sides of the same coin. If you're wielding one, you're losing the other. And as a culture, what we have lost is the recognition. But again, recognition is very tricky because recognition is making the implicit explicit. And therefore, you're already crossing the border into the masculine and you're already crossing the border. The reason you want to make it explicit is so you can wield it. And once you're wielding it, you're bringing in those limitations right away. And so there's no escaping these dynamics. When you say you're bringing in those limitations, can, can you go over that again? I'm, I'm trying to piece it, but I've lost that little bit that you, did you lose If it Princess Leia, well, and she does this to a degree in the story, but why do we, why do we love the woman that is effortlessly virtue, uh, that is effortlessly beautiful and attractive, humble and self-forgetful. And we pause at the woman who is beautiful and wields it. When we see the, be the woman who is beautiful and wields it in an agentic way, she is diminished. The woman who is beautiful and lets, in a sense, the beauty work through her. Um, and so C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce has this great illustration of Sarah Smith. And Lewis is very much taking Dante um, in, in there. And Sarah Smith is going through and there's this huge procession around him, her, she's, she's, there are many men and women attending her, the beasts, as Lewis says, are attending to her, and, and she is just the most beautiful. And he says of her, her kind of love, she had many children. And then Lewis says to MacDonald, what didn't, the parents of those children, didn't they feel threatened by the fact that she had so many children, and everyone who came, all of the children that came around her were, felt like they were her children. He said, no. That kind of love made them more secure with their parents, too. And he said, many, all, the, all the men who knew her became her lovers, in a sense. And Lewis says, well, didn't that make all the other wives feel threatened? And he said, no, because... Her kind of love made all the men who became her lovers better lovers of their own wives. And that's an example of that power. Whereas the woman who has beauty and is 
attracting other women's husbands to herself, that's not real beauty. The real beauty is the beauty that, oh, I now love my wife more because of her beauty. And and when we hear that, we almost say, that's impossible. But is it? And I think that's that's where when we, I remember Peugeot saying, trying to talk about this. This is so hard to talk about because, again, once you make it explicit, it sort of goes away. And, and that's what's so difficult about having this conversation. Because in order to bring it into the room, we have to make it masculine. And so it hides. But yet, when it happens, it just happens. We can't wield it. But it's there. Hence the, uh, my vintage fashion is helping (laughs) it to be grounded and to remain. No, but I I think that it makes sense regarding what you're saying about she who wields it. I'm thinking, I think I heard a clip um, on the symbolic world of Jonathan Peugeot speaking about the, the evil queen with her mirror, who is the fairest, and then Snow White being like, you don't know you're beautiful. Like She doesn't know she's beautiful. Like And that there is a power that surpasses um, that of her stepmother, who actually, in the original, like the original, original fairy tale, it was her biological mother. It wasn't a stepmother. They added the stepmother in later iterations to make it slightly more palatable, but it was her actual mother in the original, which really is quite telling. Um, but it's, it is something that, like, we are told, again, you can have it all. Like, you can, you can have the, the looks, and you can have the career, you can have... And it will will be of no detriment to yourself. And it does seem like it is a detriment. (laughs) I didn't have a question in there, but... No, and I think that's... I think... I didn't know that about the original, but it makes absolutely perfect sense. So what does it mean to be a human being? I would say to be a human being, we we are created to be the conduits of God... God, you know, we are image bearers of God. God flows into the world through us. He also, in um, holy, 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 um, Isaiah chapter 6, um, Isaiah goes to the temple, holy, 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 God is different. You can make no image of me. The whole earth is full of his glory. Okay, so we're not the only conduits of God to the world, but that's how we are made. And... I remember Catherine from Thunder Bay talking about this process by which the mother, first of all, the evil queen looks in a mirror. There's a tell. Because the beautiful girl who looks in the mirror all the time is not as beautiful as the beautiful girl who knows nothing of her beauty because she never looks in a mirror. And so, the... But wait, why? I don't know. But that seems to be exactly the way it is. The woman who is unselfconsciously beautiful is more beautiful than the woman who is self-consciously beautiful. Because the self-consciously beautiful is looking to take this and wield it according to her own designs. And... The good mother, this is, this is the humble selfless part, the good mother glories in the fact that her daughter is more beautiful than she is. The good mother is not threatened 
by her beautiful daughter. What's happening between the mother and the daughter there is that the mother is threatened by the beauty of the daughter. And instead, the mother should be, I want my daughter to be more beautiful than myself. And every good parent should say, I want my children to be smarter, more moral, more successful. I want my children to be greater than me. And that's actually the glory of the parent to relinquish their power to the child. That's what good parenting is. And so the mother should not be looking in the mirror, you know, anxious for her own grasp on power, but be looking at the daughter who isn't looking in a mirror and saying, do you want to know who the fairest of them all is? It's my daughter. Look at her. And the daughter doesn't even know how beautiful she is. I look at this now with Cassidy and Ferdy and their baby girl. Because in many ways, what the parent does is say, look at my child. Isn't she glorious? Don't look at me. Look at my child. And I think that's how, when that happens, glory is a funny thing. Think about two chefs. Both of them do amazing, the two, two bakers baking cakes. They both bake amazing cakes. One baker comes in with his cake and says, here's my cake, try it. And he puts it out. And so you pick up the plate and you start eating. And the baker is watching you. How is it? How is it? Isn't it great? Isn't it good? That baker diminishes the glory of the cake. The other baker comes in, puts the cake on the table, slices it, sets the table and says, enjoy, and then recedes and watches. And, or maybe doesn't even let you know they baked the cake. Isn't that how God works? And then just watches people. The baker who is conscious about their attachment to the cake diminishes the glory of the cake. The caker who sets out the cake and lets the cake be the glory, glory is multiplied. And it's the same thing with beauty. And I think that's the feminine. The feminine is the baker who sets the cake on the table and just enjoys the glory they have brought into the room. Okay, so that brings me to ask how... I mean, I, from... My wanderings over the past few years, I've come to the conclusion that it's story and narrative that helps to bring us to the grounding of what does it mean to be masculine? What does it mean to be feminine? What, like in a healthy way. Um, so I sort of just answered my own question. But I, what do you see that as the way to ground ourselves in these roles or I mean of course there are other ways but how do you see us as a society um, moving forward finding the masculine finding the feminine um, participating within it how do we do that well I think stories transmit and propagate part of the irony of has been, and part of the irony of, let's say, the Peugeot Brothers ministry has been, if you have to explain a story, something has been lost and diminished. Now, fortunately, many stories are powerful enough that an explanation of the story, if you begin to realize that that exclamation has not exhausted the story, then you know the story is yet more powerful than the explanation. As remedial effort, we have tried to explain the story. As remedial effort, we are trying to explicate the dynamics between masculine and feminine here. But we will not exhaust it, and that's good. The best kinds of stories lead us to know in a in a in the other three p's lead us into knowledge in spanish conocer rather than just saber 
They lead us to know in ways that are deeper than we can explain. And so in that sense, stories are great transmitters because little girls might watch Star Wars and say, I want to be Princess Leia. Do they know why? No. They just know that's what I want to be. Oh, so you want to be the center of the story. He's like, no, 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 Luke is the center of the story. No, 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 it's Leia. And the little girls might know that intuitively because they know that Luke is actually chasing. She's the one. So stories have that built into them. And so I, that's why I think on one hand, and I think Jonathan's pivot from doing all videos, explaining stories, this is how symbolism works, to getting into, here's the story. It's sort of like the baker, here's the cake. That kind of feminine energy requires a deep trust, in my opinion, in God. The masculine says, I need to make it happen. The feminine says, I'm going to let it happen. Will it happen? I don't know. It may happen. It may not happen. But I'm going to let it happen. Instead of, here's the story. Here's what the story is about. It's like explaining a joke. And if the explanation exhausts what it seeks to explain, it's spent. So we've talked quite a bit about the feminine, which I'm sure all of you here can very much appreciate being, <laughs> being the lovely men that you are. But, but, so, so we've talked about, well, I mean, a lot has changed for, for women in, in modernity and in this sort of post-modernity, as you were saying. But, so for, and I, do, I actually do have a picture of what, because um, that's what I focused on. I, I have a good picture of what it does mean to be feminine and to participate. Again, part of it is, well, it's not talking about it. It's joining the knitting club on Discord, which I broke into tears about a couple of nights ago when I was talking about it. I'm glad I got that out of my system. <laughs> but it's, it's a participation in like the ancient arts of knitting. <laughs> but it, it is. It, it was, and it touched something deep within me, and it was beyond what it was, you know, and these such things. But for, for... I mean, I have three sons, so this is within my interests as well, and within society's interests, but I have a selfish personal interest of wanting my sons to know, know where they're going and what to embody as they go forward. And so what, what are men to do? <laughs> You've given a good explanation of what, how, how, what, how the feminine works. It's re relinquishing control and allowing things to happen. But for men, like taking up, well, dare I say taking up their cross? <laughs> like, like what do they do? What, what, what's their direction? What's their path? I, I think actually men have been doing what they've always done. Women say, you know, part of the, way, part of the reason Part of the reason women have been in the marketplace, a big part of the reason women, let's say in America, after the 1970s started getting into paying careers was when divorce rates began to climb, many women realized, I can't trust men. If they divorce me, you know, some of those divorces were initiated by women, but if the man divorces me, I don't have a career. And so many women and fathers said to their daughters, at least get a degree so that if the marriage fails, you have something to fall back on. Now, this is, of course, after things like dowries and bride prices, which had been, which had been practices in the older world where if the marriage fails, that big 
lump of money, she gets that because she's going to need that. And so there are all these adaptations. And so in many ways, men have been doing what they've always done, and the women said, I need a job. Okay. Men have been continuing, just as it says in Ephesians 5, men have been continuing to lay down their lives for the women. And it was a woman who made this point to me. Actually, it's behind the paywall. Um, I remember now it was Laura who made the point, and it's so funny because every time Laura and I do a conversation, Laura's like, we can't post this out on the open internet. So you're being very feminine about this. You're staying hidden. Can I post it behind the $3 membership? Yes, you can. Okay. And we have some of our best conversations, but she says, oh, women totally run the show. And men continue to do what they've always done. The woman says, this is what I need. And the men say, okay. If that's what you want, honey, I will do it. And that's what men need to continue to do. Now, the difficulty about that for women is be careful what you ask for because the good man will probably give it to you. But now you bear the burden of agency and responsibility because you've set the table and life always has consequences. So I think men, men continue to try to, good men continue to try to do what they've always done, which is serve the women in their lives. Fathers serve their daughters. Fa uh, husbands serve their wives. That's what Ephesians 5 says. And um, it's that subtle dance. So I think men are continuing to try to figure out how can we serve these women, especially now that they're not exactly sure what they want? And sometimes they're asking for things and then getting it and saying, no, that's not what I wanted. Okay, well, what do you want now? And the men keep doing it. Men have always laid down their lives for their women. They've done it in war. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 says to men, that's your job. Lay down your lives for your women. And they do. So men have to keep figuring that out. And that's why I think the part of the manosphere, which is like men need to take control of women. It's never going to work. <laughs> yeah, you can be a jerk. You can use women. But then you'll never know the power of masculine and feminine working together because that's the power of the world. So, yeah, that's men have to men men are men are still chasing the women around. And it's the women saying, "I want this, I want that." And so the men are, "Okay. Okay." But hopefully together we'll continue to figure it out. Okay. But, <laughs> but Okay, so my say my sons grow up and they're uh, young adults. Like they don't have to be in a relationship or the other half of a a like if they're going if they're striving to be a good man, they might not have a partner yet. So what about the single men? Do you know what I mean? Like I, okay, you are giving a sort of bird's eye view example of society, but like bringing it down um, on a, an individual level where there's not necessarily a partnership going on it, and it might be um, single men. Like I've heard the statistics about so many men who feel like they don't know, they don't have a direction, they don't, and not in like a derogatory way, like, oh, in their basement playing video games, but they might be like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And yes, a good woman can inspire you action, but if, it, if that's not being seen, um, how do you inspire a young man to go forth? Well, your sons, as they grow up, um, and because, at least from what I've seen from you, I, I, I imagine you're a very good mother, 
And as your boys grow into men, even though they might not listen to you and take all of, all of your advice, if you were in trouble, there's probably nothing they wouldn't do for you. So again, the feminine implicitly directs the masculine. That's the way it works. Now, there's going to be other feminine powers in the world. The church is what? The bride of Christ. And so obviously, if they're in a church, they might not have a woman in their life directing them, but perhaps the bride of Christ is directing, is directing them and being the gravitation towards which they, they flow. And um, men, there are always, there's always feminine, there's always the feminine around directing men. And so whether it's a mother or whether it's a wife or whether it's an institution, you know, why, for example, are ships always feminine? And all the little sailors <laughs> are serving the ship. That's, there will be plenty of feminine for them to follow. And um, not everyone, not every man will become a husband or a father, but there will be plenty of other roles for them to follow. And yeah, I, I don't, men will always, men will always seek it out. That's just what they do. I'm skeptical though. <laughs> I, I, I suppose it is a fear. I, I'm afraid that the, the, the fembots or whatever will come and capture attention. This is easier. There's a path of least resistance. She won't make me feel bad about my Fortnite habits or like whatever, you know, whatever. Like it, it's something that is a very real concern. Like there's not, okay, there might be, there might be battles being fought around the world or wars, but there's not like a great war to draw all the young men towards a cause to rise up and, and show their worth. It feels like, it feels like there isn't a calling, and which is why so many people are here because of someone like Jordan Peterson or John Verveke or Jonathan Peugeot because they're giving a call of sorts that men respond to. That's why there's mostly men here rather than women because it's there's, there's, a, there's a message touching on something and it seems to be this like call to responsibility, call to be your best. But like, why was that need there in the first place? There's a brutal balance to reality, which is when things aren't working well, they fall apart. And when they fall apart, think about chivalry. Who is the knight? The knight is beholden to a woman, not a woman that he will ever possess, but a woman that that is his North Star, who is pure. And of course, just look at Mary in the Catholic Church. She's pure. She's a perpetual virgin. Um, and so, yes, there's porn, and there's Fortnite, and there are all of these traps that men can fall into. And if there's enough of these traps and enough, man, enough are falling into, society tends to go down. I was talking to Teddy about the Ukraine, and he was talking to me about Russian and Ukrainian and all of these things, and I was like, and I said, but then the war is a distraction. He said, no, 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 the war is not a distraction. The war is, whoop, all of the attention. The war is, in a sense, feminine. It's the context. And now all of these, do you think that Ukraine is full of a whole bunch of young men that are wasting themselves on porn and Fortnite right now? No, a much stronger thing has taken hold of them. And they are training and taking up arms. And now that's brutal. And we certainly don't want things to fall that way. But there's a cycle to this. And so what we try to do is arrest the cycle before it gets that bad, but that's part of how the world works. So, yes, as things fall apart, well, the masculine and the feminine will go to 
greater lengths and things will get corrected. And this is part of the reason why wars of various kinds and various levels of physical violence are so endemic. Because as things fall apart, the feminine will call the masculine and the masculine will act. Now hopefully the feminine is directing in a good way and the masculine is acting in a good way, but again, think of chivalry in the night. The female is unobtainable, which means the masculine has infinite potential towards her. And if that is functioning properly, balance can be restored. Is it the force? Is that? No. Okay. Because... And so that's why the maiden waits to receive the assertion of the man. And so what's the difference between the good mother and the devouring mother? You want your boys to reach their potential. You don't want your boys to get trapped in porn, Fortnite, alcohol, and I'm going to keep my boys away from porn, Fortnite, alcohol, and drugs. And so you try to, you become the devouring mother. You lock your little boys in a box, and you keep them from all the bad things. Now that they're little, your boys are still small, so no screens, I'll only let you watch these YouTubes. You know, that's the job for you right now, for them, their sides. But if they're 25, and they're still living at home, Mom, can I watch another Jordan Peterson video? Which Only one? Only Jordan Which Peterson, one? not Paul Vanderclay. <laughs> He'll lead you astray. Um, if you're doing that when they're at 25, well, now you're using assertive energy. You're trying to make it happen instead of letting it happen with the feminine energy that would be more appropriate for the relationship, and that's the difference. The devouring mother versus the, the beautiful mother who, well, why don't they, why won't they get caught in these traps? Because my love for my mother isn't controlling me, it is drawing me. Oh, you're going to make me tear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned crying before, and so... Women in the Christian Reformed Church are now elders, deacons, pastors. They participate at Synod of the Christian Reformed Church because everybody was sort of watching that through me last summer. A lot of, you know, some people were complaining, and some of the women on the Synod floor cried. And I heard a bunch of men say, oh, see, that's the problem. They cried on the Synod floor. And I thought, well, this is interesting. Because a woman crying is sort of a little telling moment of this dynamic of power. Well, how do tears manipulate you? You think, well, why, why are you so reactive to a woman crying? Ah, because her tears are expressing her pain and some masculine thing in you is saying, I don't want her to feel pain. And so a woman's tears are powerful. But you might think, how could tears have power? Oh, it's feminine power. And so when men feel that, they're, she's using her power. <laughs> and that's the struggle we're always in. Men... Well, when men cry, they are using feminine energy and feminine power. And so for many women, when, when women see men cry, when men see women cry, men want to save the women. 
when women see men cry, women think, I can trust them. So I had a, um, I had a guy who was an older guy who had taught a lot of children and said, boys and girls in school are different. Girls come to school and look at the teacher and say, can I trust the teacher? Boys come to school to look at the teacher and say, is the teacher competent? When women are looking for men, what are they looking for? Can I trust him? Watch the golden bachelor now. Look at this guy. He listens. He loved his wife. He cries. These women look at him and say, oh, I can trust him. Oh, that's attractive. But there's some feminine energy in there. Women also look sometimes at the man who is strong and assertive. And so women see that potential and think, wow. If that man has his eyes on me, all of that power will be directed where I direct it. Now again, if the woman is thinking that, we think, oh, she's a manipulative shrew. <laughs> but the woman who, for whom that is true and is selfless and is good and is pure will direct all of that male potent energy power strength to the good. And so suddenly she has, I've seen this often, very masculine men have very feminine wives and a combination like that, incredible, incredible. Because nobody looks at that woman and says, oh, she's a manipulative shrew. They look at that woman and think, I wish I had a wife like her. And that very powerful man knows it and whatever that woman wants, she gets. So I have a story slightly, it's not even a story, but it's a, it's a, an adage, I guess, not even an adage. No, it's just a, a situation in my life where when, I, when, I, when my husband and I were, became engaged, um, and actually and years into our marriage, I would, my friends would always say, you're so lucky to have your fiance. You're so lucky to have your husband. I'm like, he's lucky to have me. <laughs> like that's like, I would, I mean, I wouldn't say that right away. The first 10 times I was like, yeah, I know. Thank you. Yes. But then, but then like the 11th and 12th and 50th, I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. He's wonderful. He's phenomenal. I know. He's lucky to have me too, guys. And that was me rearranging my feminine energy into a little more assertive masculine. I'm nice too. He's lucky to have me. Thanks, you know. But and I don't even know if I said this. I just thought it. But <laughs> but it it's be, it it is not to be um, not to be downplayed how um, blessed I am to have a really wonderful husband. But. To the point about the tears uh, thing, uh, there's a there's a George McDonald's story called The Light Princess. I don't know if any of you have heard it. I would recommend it. So I um, I had to read it for a children's literature class, but it's it, it's been I think of 20 years since I've read it, but I still remember the moral. And so she she doesn't have gravity, so she's light, but she's also takes everything lightly. So she can never be serious. And it isn't until, um, super symbolic, there's like a snake that's like sucking up the, at the bottom of a lake, that's whatever. But it isn't until the prince figure is near death and he's sacrificing himself to the snake or something like this in order to save her. And she, she can't take it seriously, she's making jokes the whole time. But it isn't until she cries and has tears that she finally finds her gravity and grave it's it's again these double meanings is these puns he's doing dad jokes <laughs> but, but it's she finds her gravity and she so she's no longer floating and she's able to be serious and um 
So I mean, I guess I'm just saying George MacDonald really understood the power of tears as well. Um, I think that we're supposed to wrap up now, but I, I mean, I think this was See, a... Cassidy nods her head. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this was really wonderful. Um, thank you for sharing your wisdom, Paul, and sharing about the feminine and the masculine. And thank you for um, listening and um, putting yourselves into a passive role to receive. <laughs> so this was wonderful. Thank you very much.